Hi, everyone. Uh, Trends Literature Series definitely has emerged now as one of the leading platforms for knowledge sharing podcasts with very, very famous personalities across the globe. So successfully, we have touched now around 150 stories covering literature, cinema, thrill, mysteries, crime thrillers, biographies, and whatnot with very, very renowned names in writing and uh, other fields too, and spearheading more with the vision of sharing knowledgeable insights. So do subscribe to our channel. And I'm Meeta Neja with our 152nd episode today. I have today Meeti Shroff Shah with the latest book, uh, Matrimonial Murder. In fact, she has graced her platform earlier too with a very, very interesting book, The Death of uh, Kriti uh, Kardikya. So welcome once again, Meeti. Such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely the last time as well. It's a, it's a pleasure always to host you. So it would be really, really lovely to hear from you about your introduction. So many things have happened since the last time we spoke. And I think you're the best person to talk about yourself. Yeah. Um. So I'm primarily writing mysteries these days. And my, why my mind goes to crime fiction, I can't tell. But uh, these days, the preoccupation has been that. In fact, there are three releases this year. One is my full-length Temple Hill mystery, A Matrimonial Murder. Uh, there's another one uh, that's come out in Feb, which is a short story, which was included in the uh, Hachette's Book of Indian Detective Fiction. If y'all have not read it, it's a lovely collector's uh, item. And uh, it's packed with uh, mysteries and crime fiction from authors across the subcontinent. So that's a, that's a must pick up. And the next one that's coming out is another short mystery, which is going to be in the CWA anthology in the UK called Miss Midsummer Mysteries. So it's been a very busy year. Um, and here we are. Fantastic. I've been hearing such great news about this anthology also that you've been talking about. And of course, this book that we are going to talk about today, A Matrimonial Murder, very exciting. I must tell everyone to pick up a copy and read. It's it's going to make your Sunday the way it did mine. So here we are. So what really inspired you to write A Matrimonial Murder? I know it's again another Temple Hill mystery that you've written. Those of you who, those of you who followed her in the last book know that uh, what we are talking about. Now you, we have the author here today talking about the book. Yeah. So with The Matrimonial Murder, we go back to the most uh, gossipiest, wealthiest yes. Gujarati neighborhood of South Bombay. Mm -hmm. And this time, uh, Radhi Zaveri, my protagonist, she finds herself at this very uh, prestigious matrimonial bureau. And uh, there's a very powerful matchmaker there called Sarla Seth. Who, and, she's, and Radhi is there doing research because she's writing a book on arranged marriages. But the most, uh, the Sarla said, the powerful matchmaker there uh, is in a bit of trouble. She's been receiving these um, very threatening tarot cards, you know. And um, so she's, she's not taking it seriously um, until finally there is a death, a murder in, at the matrimonial bureau. And she realizes that things are not as harmonious as she thought at her beloved soul harmony. So with this book, Radhi... Uh, deep dives into the elite matchmaking landscape of South Bombay amongst the Gujaratis. She talks to astrologers, match uh, wedding planners, and goes on arranged dates. And uh, as she begins to talk to people, she realizes that there's something amiss. So, but how did you really come up with this idea of uh, you know combining this elite matchmaking with a murder mystery? So I don't know. This idea I... really crop up to you. I don't know if I did it consciously, but uh, I had an arranged marriage uh, and my first, very first book, which is not even a mystery, it used to be, it's, it was called, Do You Know Any Good Boys? by uh, which yeah, was, by Pan Macmillan. And it was a, a guide for the Indian woman uh, to navigate the arranged marriage. Hmm. So I met 40 men when I was um, looking uh, for my husband. Uh, so <laughs> during this time, I met all sorts of characters, 
matchmakers, these aunties who run these matrimonial bureaus from their homes. And they're so powerful because they, because within that little community, they really have a great uh, sway. They hold sway over this community. And I met all these different characters and uh, I suppose it stayed with me. And when I, when it came to writing the next mystery, I thought it'd be really fun to uh, combine these worlds. So it's all about your observations which you've had around your marriage. And I, I can understand that, you know, and uh, you're talking about these typical aunties, definitely. And they have, they come with a very, very typical expression, I always. Uh, Radhi, Radhika is indeed a very, very interesting part of your book. In fact, the main protagonist. So uh, can you uh, somehow tell us more about Radhika without giving too much away and her journey? And how did you really kind of frame that character? You know, it's always very interesting because most of our viewers on this platform are also the ones who read and also the ones who are going to write. So it's very interesting. It becomes very interesting to talk about character sketching and how does it happen and how did Radhika come about? And she's definitely a very strong character. Very interesting. An author like you. Yeah. Um. So I thought it would be interesting to have a character who's got some perspective. So with Radhi, uh, uh, when I say perspective, it means that she's viewing this world, this Temple Hill world that I wanted to you know, write about. She's viewing it at some sort of a distance because mm. unlike the rest of the people around her, she's gone abroad and lived abroad for uh, a good decade. And then she comes back to uh, this world. And so she's viewing it with some, um, with uh, there's a different perspective to how she views these people. This is a world she's very, and in, she's intimately fond of this world. She's very familiar with this world. And yet she can, she has the slight outsider's um, point of view. Um, with Radhi, she just ambled into my head one day. I haven't really uh, uh, analyzed uh, how she came about, but I will tell you a couple of things. Her name just came to me, and I and since that day, I you know how with other characters you write, write a list of interesting options, how easy to pronounce the names are going to be, how memorable the names are going to be. None of that uh, calibration. Uh, had to happen when it came to Radhi Zaveri. Radhika Zaveri was just a name that uh, spoke to me. And uh, if you ask me about the character, she's uh, uh, she's of course got uh, some of me in her, meaning she's a writer and she belongs to the Jain community that I come from, the Gujarati Jain community. And But she's also gets to do all the things that uh, I uh, can't do or I'm afraid to do or haven't dared to do <laughs> so for instance um, Radhi's got this fantastic metabolic rate and you see her munching uh, yeah. all sorts of snacks um, during the book without counting calories and she's yeah. uh, which I thought what what fun to have some uh, to for someone to be able to do that because yeah. I'm calorie conscious you know yeah. so so I'm just giving an example so she, Radhi can do stuff that I wouldn't uh, think of doing and that's how the character came you're so very right about that the food becomes an integral part definitely and you're so right about her metabolic part and especially when she compares herself with what Nishant is eating so it becomes a part of it definitely I mean all these are it's so nice that you're admitting that some of it is your reflection and what you've observed so it, so do you think these observations become easier for a writer to kind of put it together do you make a note of what you want to kind of put in the character or it does just happens because it is a natural uh, observation? Uh, observations about people? You're, uh, I, you're asking about people? Yeah, yeah obs the, your daily observations, like you just kind of mentioned about her diet. That became a big part that she's kind of munching everything. So, so it was like your way of uh, giving it back. Yeah, it's liberating, no, for the yeah. character. Yeah. But uh, in terms of other, uh, these are not very conscious observations. I do know of writers who maintain these little diaries where they will uh, make, a, they're more disciplined about it and they'll make a note of interesting situations and uh, interesting uh, conversations they hear or situations they are in or they might have read about in the paper. Uh, I have only very recently started doing it consciously where I now keep a diary of interesting characters I come across an interesting snippets of conversation that I have with them. So um, 
but other but so far it hasn't been i'm also evolving as a writer and now i feel it might it might be so much fun to have a bank of these uh, little snippets and characters and who knows you know when uh, when you need it <laughs> yeah when when you need it yes but you know uh, sarla's character also is very interesting i know you said that it's kind of part of the book entirely based on matrimonial alliance uh, plays and uh, so sarla got out of that, that character got out of your observation because how did you like no, develop her any, <laughs> this is not based on any actual real person okay. <laughs> yeah, most of the characters are composites Hmm. you'll take writers invariably tend to do that they'll take one or two characteristics from some person they know or one two from somebody else and then they'll add some of their own uh you know thoughts to that character so i don't think it's she's based on anybody uh i just wanted her to be uh this powerful self made woman on temple hill which is uh not very uh, common for that generation because uh, you know women on a certain of a certain generation i'd say my mother's generation it was frowned upon to work outside the home so she, you know she's kind of created this uh, whole business from the ground up because she's clearly passionate about matchmaking and she reads people so well and you know it almost makes you wonder that in another world another time uh, what she could have done uh, with all her many talents so and she does mention that whenever she sees somebody she is able to kind of very automatically yeah, her. connect her so that is definitely intuition that she's blessed with she has a radar for it an instinct for it and she's been doing it for so long so she's experienced and yeah, yeah. so that makes the story very interesting i mean it's such a easy read and it just gets you going this book you know your book really uh, mixes social satire and humor suspense everything how do you balance all these elements in your books i would say even the, even the earlier book had elements this book again because it's all based against temple hill in mumbai which is definitely as it um, is definitely a fascinating story but fascinating backdrop for the story so how does it happen with you how do you really mix up all these elements together i firmly believe that uh, people read mysteries or at least i read mysteries uh there are two reasons for it one is of course the puzzle mm -hmm. the you know how the murder happens who and the who the who does who who did it how did they yeah how did they do it so the puzzle of that mm -hmm. and the second very important aspect of a mystery is the world it is set in mm -hmm. so as a reader i'm always drawn to uh what uh, say for example i'm reading a mystery set in on the scottish highlands or in a little village in quebec i am interested in what they are wearing and what they are eating and what are the festivals they are celebrating and what are the sports they are uh, playing so uh any book and uh, and also uh, mysteries included are a glimpse right into another life another kind of um, landscape and a world so even with uh, my temple hill mystery series i did not want it to just be a, a simple uh murder mystery wherein uh, where uh, the, a crime happens and the detective is this intelligent person who comes and solves the crime because the police are bumbling idiots it it didn't have to, i didn't want it to be that straight mm -hmm. you know I, we are all all the characters are informed by the uh, by the way they've been brought up by the world that they inhabit by the the conventions that bind them the things that they do for most of my characters you will notice they are really well to do wealthy people but they are in a prison of their own making they are so conscious mm -hmm. of appearances of how the world perceives them of how um, uh, so the kind of holidays they'll take the kind of uh, choices they make are all very very dictated by the world that surrounds them and and so these are the real people right and that is uh what i wanted to uh focus on as well in the story that wh why are the certain choices being made you know why are the characters acting in the way they are acting it's it's a very much a product of the environment and the their upbringing and all of that i know because such vivid um, you know the atmospheric settings the and everything that you've done and your detailing definitely is praiseworthy but without giving much of spoilers i mean can you share your process 
for crafting the intricate plot and the twisted plot somehow of this book. I don't want you to give away much, but yes, the, the process, how, how did it happen and how long did it take you to write this book and everything maybe can come together in this. Yeah. Oh, I think each, each of these, my books are taking me about two years to write. Uh, I do plot very extensively. Uh, so I always admire when people say that they, they're pansters and then they sort of go with wherever the characters take them. A lot of my, uh, I, I mean, I can't begin until I don't know how, how I'm going to end. Mm -hmm. So that's always very clear in my head where I'm headed. The And how I'm going to get there also, I need to have some roadmap for it. Because with a mystery, unlike any other genre, there are so many cliffhangers, red herrings that you keep planting in the book, clues. Uh, for those of you who don't know, red herrings are, they, they are misleading clues. Like there are some real clues in the book. And then the writer also has to go and plant some clues that are going to mislead the detective mm -hmm. and by, uh, by extension, the reader. Mm -hmm. So there's so much of these that you have to plant and so many questions that you have to open up that in the end, you need to tie up all of this very neatly. Otherwise, you, if you have too many loose ends, it's not a very satisfying mystery for the person reading it. Because they'll keep saying, but why had they, why, what about that? What about that? That shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Everything should be answered in a very satisfying way towards the end. Which means that a lot of plotting does go into it. But having said that, my characters are surprising me all the time. In the sense, in the conversations, they'll say, suddenly have with each other in uh, suddenly they'll do things which I had not planned for them and at that time what I'm learning is it's best to get out of the way and not ruin things you know <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing something then follow them because they, le they lead you to interesting places which how much ever you try and plot you're not going to get there by the, because writing is part inspiration as well right so yeah. definitely very interesting but how do you really keep the suspense and I know you told just now that you take took three years to develop the story and when we start your book we can't wait to finish it so you understand three years versus maybe three yes. four hours that we want to take and finish this and know everything so how does it feel how does it I mean how is it with you to keep the suspense and mystery uh, mystery alive throughout the story and you really discuss it with your husband sometimes and now your daughter's growing up Perhaps you want to discuss with her, take some answers out. Is it also maybe some way, a little bit of a team effort with them too? My husband is my beta reader. So okay. the very first rough draft he gets to read. Oh, fantastic. Uh, How proud he must be of him, I'm sure. He is, he is. So he he gets to read the first draft and he he's unfailingly honest sometimes more than I would like him to be <laughs> so he's very uh, honest and he can be very blunt <laughs> about what's working with the book and what's not working with the book and uh, uh, what happens when you're writing a mystery is that since I already know all the places that I need the reader to be surprised I'm not getting surprised with it when I'm reading it for the second or the third yeah. time yeah. so I need at least for that part of it, I need someone else to tell me um, if the suspense, uh, if the surprise angles, the twists, the turns, if they're working and they're uh, effective, right? So I get feedback from him. Then I work on another draft. Then I have a couple of very close friends who um, beta read for me. So with each reading, I get their feedback and uh, work it into the book if, you know, uh, and that's, it's pretty much a three to four month process, the editing of it, the various different drafts that I uh, work on. Fantastic. And also, um, I was also recently noticing that you have a group of lovely women writers in Mumbai and you're born together. So how does it happen? Most of them are writing perhaps in the same genre or perhaps they are fiction writers. You have Kiran Minral there, you have Meghna Pant. They've been on our platform earlier. Right. So, so how does it, uh, work being in a hub where you have multiple women writers so do they advise each other how does the whole environment work I think whatever my interactions so far have been with this uh, with these writers with uh, this group uh, they've been so positive and encouraging and it's really uh, 
wonderful to see how if women put their mind to it how much they can come and raise other women up like it, it's a uh, you know i don't know how it's perceived otherwise but it's a really great support system to have because there are some uh say some problems that only writers are going to face or understand and it's nice to have someone who goes through these exact um, the writing can be very lonely you know uh, mm. as a as an activity it's uh, mm. lonely it's there's a uh, moody also it's, you can be moody at times writing somebody needs to understand that as well yeah and in fact uh, there are days when you're sitting and at the blank page and it's just torture because you haven't been able to uh, uh, say anything meaningful on the page mm -hmm. and there are not, there aren't too many people who understand what it's like to uh, stare at that blank page or write or or after like 5 hours of sitting at the computer to actually get up with like uh, 20 30 words on the page you know which is which happens to more, all writers write professionally. Uh, why shouldn't it, right? Like it's it, every day can't be a good uh, day for it. But the point is to show up. But so there are not too many people who will understand that. So it's lovely to have a whole group of writers who are going through this. Also, uh, Nita, I want to mention at this point that uh, why it's important that these writers are women. Because I think in, in India especially, women face a very specific set of challenges which I don't think men writers face. Uh, you, you, you know, as a woman who uh, who's also trying to make a career, you, I mean, I, I know I do a lot of the kin keeping in the family, which means I remember people's birthdays and what to get them. And if I'm inviting people, what is the menu we are going to have a uh, set? And do we have the groceries at home? And so much of that. Even child rearing, uh, you know, however progressive and advanced we may be as a society, women are st still doing the heavy lifting of uh, all of this, the homekeeping, child rearing, kin keeping, all of that, right? So as women writers, there's a very specific set of experiences that uh, women relate to, you know, and there are times when I've been, when I'm writing and I'm in the middle of some great uh, thought or some revelation to me and my help will come and knock on the door and say salad karna hai, cut par gol karna hai ya lamba karna hai <laughs> <laughs> like it's you know so despite yeah. having all the help in the world there are these uh, challenges I, I, I mean I wouldn't call them call, call them challenges but they, there are these disruptions that women writers face you know in their uh, work mm -hmm. Totally so, understand. You are in the middle of the idea and it goes all throughout through the roof. What happened? So your creativity goes around because you are have to do these mundane things which are part of our part daily of lives. Yeah. Even if you are the CEO or whatever, you need to, it's taken for granted. I was watching a video by Palki today morning and it was talking about similar things. But yeah, I can understand more, more to do with the writers. I mean, you're in the middle of writing, concentrating art. And suddenly, yeah, yeah what kind fact, of salad, uh, what kind of, as you just mentioned, lamba kate or gol kate? Uh, are kato. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, there is this um, book uh, called Daily Rituals uh, okay. of Artists by uh, Mason Kari. I'm not, I forget the name of the author. So he came up with this book where he follows uh, or he has done a lot of research and interviewed a lot of artists across the spectrum, writers, mm -hmm. musicians, um, you know, artists, and he talks about the uh, the their day, the, a day in the life of, okay, a day in the life of Jane Austen, or sorry, not Jane Austen, but a day in the life of uh, a writer, a writer, or a musician, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. like Beethoven or Picasso. And at some point, uh, the book came out very widely reviewed, very widely uh, celebrated. The book was, and we all of us went and picked it up. But at some point, he came out and he said, I have an admission to make because since the book has come out, a lot of people have reached out to me. And I have realized that all the, out of all the artists and writers I've covered, 80 to 85% are men. And the daily uh, rituals of a man, can't pos a woman can't possibly identify with it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense, uh, so he talks about how Heming, some Hemingway or someone was, would get up and go for a walk in the morning and then come back and read two newspapers and then have tea and then go pet his dog and then enter his study to write. And, and shaving at their leisure. Please yeah. don't miss that. Yeah. <laughs> and the women came out and said, look, the women artists don't work like that. We don't have that kind of a le uh, leisurely mornings if we, you know, and then the writer talks about how he came out and his lunch was ready on the table and oh then he <laughs> lunch because he's got a wife to do this stuff. So women, right? So, so there's, uh, there's a whole uh, host of artists who reached out to him and said, look, you need to do a, so he came and came back, came back into a separate one for women. And it says Please. daily rituals for women artists. Or, oh, lovely. Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. I will definitely go. I will send you the exact uh, name of the book. Oh, lovely. This is our daily thing and we need to kind of get going with it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. happened like that, it cannot change really. So, but do you have any rituals or habits which really help you to stay productive? I know you have your non-productive days and productive days, but what keeps you? Because you've come out with these awesome books and I'm sure you've had your time of distractions and all every woman faces. But at the same time, I'm sure you have some habits which have made you stay productive in writing and come out with consistent good work. So how does it happen with you? I think uh, for writing, uh, consistently writing well, you need to consistently read well. It's what you're feeding uh, your uh, soul, mm. right? The more, the kind of literature you consume, the kind of, even the kind of uh, television you consume. I'm very mm. picky about the kind of uh, shows I watch, the films I watch and the books I read uh, because I feel all of it informs me as an art artist, you know. I'm sure. So that's a very big one, I think. Mm. Also to not let uh, writer's blocks throw you off your routine. I think... Um, if you can manage that, if you can manage that kind of discipline with your writing. Mm -hmm. So, because writer's blocks are going to happen. Mm -hmm. You are going to come to a situation or a page and you're going to get stuck and you don't know what those characters should be doing at that point. Despite all the plotting that happens very regularly. Uh, and at that time, what I typically do is I put that scene away and uh, start working on a completely different scene, which might happen, say... Uh, 100 pages down the line but I know that scene is important to the novel that confrontation or that conversation is important so I'll go and work on that um, scene and invariably what uh, does two things one is it keeps me in touch with my characters in the world so I don't completely go in I'm not going in doing something completely different and b my subconscious is working on where I'm stuck at so while I'm actively working on a different scene my subconscious is hard at work is what I've realized so if I can trust it, at some point I do come back and I have have some idea of where to go with it. So um, I think those are the two things that I have, uh, that, that's a muscle I think I'm developing as a writer as I go. Fantastic. But uh, any specific authors or because you're into mystery writing. So I think I would have asked you this question in the last episode as well. But some authors or some books you really think influenced your writing. And uh, kind of maybe perhaps few of the favorite mystery writers you have, or you think you have your own unique style of writing. Mystery. I uh, certainly do think I have a, a my own unique uh, style of writing because I uh, I don't think you can. Uh, I, I mean I don't think uh, when you're working and you're writing and you're creating art, you're not copying art is not necessarily something that's uh, fulfilling for you. But yeah, there are lots of mystery writers whom I love and who I'm sure subconsciously I have uh, learned a lot from them in terms of how they pace the book, in terms of the kind of importance they give to the world building. For example, there is this uh, writer called Louise Penny uh, in uh, Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. She writes the Three, Three Pines uh, series, the Three Pines mysteries based in the small Quebec village called Three Pines. She's on her 20th book. She's won every award possible. Uh, I And her world, the way she describes the weather, the mm. harsh, 
cold snow uh, falling outside and the crackling fires inside the cafe and the mm-hmm. kind of food the characters are eating and they're eating open bacon sandwiches and all sorts of things and I'm a vegetarian and I am still uh, salivating at the thought of the food they're eating because of the way she describes it, right? So the kind of attention she pays to those kind of details. Uh, closer home, Sujata Masse, though she's not in India, she's based in the US, but she writes mysteries um, that are uh, uh, set against a Bombay backdrop and her uh, uh, Persis uh, mystery, Parve- Parveen mystery. So there are two, I get always get confused. One is Sujata Masse's series and one is Vasim Khan's Malabar House series. Okay. And they both write very interesting mysteries. One is about the India's first female inspector who's, who turns a detective. Mm-hmm. And Sujata Masse's is the India's first female lawyer who turns okay. detective. So they both write these fantastic series and uh, I love uh, their work. Fantastic. And and coming back to your book, so what kind of feedback you've been receiving because it's fairly recently out. I know there's been a lot of rave people love reading it. Bloomsbury, I think, has done a great job publishing this wonderful book and um, and the cover and everything. But kind of feedback and any memorable comments or reviews that you've been getting on the book, which kind of said, yes, it's, it's been worth all these three years of putting it together. Um, it, it's been it's been lovely. I have had lots of people reach out, uh, readers, uh, just like simple messages saying love the book or can't wait to see what Radhi does next or oh my god we need to go back and read the first one now because they loved matrimonial murder so much that they want to read Kirti Kadak- the death of Kirti Kadakya again. So lots of um, uh, readers reaching out. Also the endorsements this book received uh, this time. Yeah. Uh, if you see Ratna Pathak Shah, yeah, uh, she's, if you see the it's whole thing, on. and uh, she's had some lovely things to say about it, a deep dive into the great Indian obsession, marriage making. The book is a sumptuous Gujarati wedding thali. All the flavors are served up. The base note of old relationships, the tanginess of sharp characters, the bittersweetness of romance, and the mirchi of murder. So she's she loved the book. Lilit Dube is another... Mm. Uh, person who, sh- who, who said she tells a great twisted tale with acute observations about the people in the world she inhabits, all done with aplomb and assurance. Keeps you guessing till the end. Apart from that, there are uh, Sujata Masse, who yes. work I mentioned, yeah. she has lovely things to say. Vasim Khan, they've all, these are all writers whom I've admired and uh, they were on my wish list for the first time, but I couldn't get through them. And this, this book, they've managed to read the book and had kind things to say. So it's been oh, how, how wonderful. I'm, I'm very grateful yeah i'm very grateful yeah. and but do you plan to really continue uh, radhi's story in future books perhaps is that uh, yeah, i'm working connected? on the next one already i'm uh, into it elbow deep into it so definitely i i see a third book coming out and uh, who knows i mean if i uh, there are lots of uh, places radhi can go i just uh, mm. <laughs> have to have the stamina to follow her you know so we'll see so uh, now uh, this year is going to be very exciting with so many projects coming up. Yes, and... in fact, the Death of Kirti Kadakya, which is getting translated into Japanese. So the oh Japanese translation. Yes, so it's called a Mumbai Murder Mystery uh, Abroad, the Death of Kirti Kadakya. The name that's the name for the book in the UK, and uh, they and the ja- uh, a Japanese publisher has bought it, and a translation is coming out this year. So lots of interesting things uh, in 2000. How did you reach out to Japan and how did you know UK out. publishing that's coming up? That's a great news. Oh, the book was, all these books, uh, Nita, have been published in the UK first and then in India. Okay. okay. My story is okay. Yeah. No, I have another publisher called Joff Books in the UK. Okay. It, so the way it happened is my uh, book was picked up in the UK first. And, and then it became a, uh, I mean, I signed a, Thing for making it a series like a three book series minimum and then it was picked up in India by Bloomsbury okay. so uh, I've always had two publishers for this uh, thing and uh, the UK uh, folks are the ones who made the Japanese thing happen for me so I feel uh, you know the word of mouth and how publishers are picking up your books and different genres different languages so what had so do you think this has been the most rewarding part of your writing journey so far? 
that in no time you are where you are. Your uh, genuineness shows, your honesty shows towards work. So what do you think has been the most rewarding? Let's let's frame it like this. What's been the most rewarding for you as far as the journey goes? I know, apart from the support from the family, I'm sure your daughter also reads the books now. He's, she's grown up uh, now. I've told her she has to wait till she's 13 years old to read my books. Okay. But she reads the short mysteries I've been writing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, see, emotionally rewarding, if you're asking me, then it's when readers come and tell you, you know, that, or like when people message and say, even friends and family that, oh my God, we are, we, I stayed up till two yesterday to finish your book or things like that. And career wise, I think uh, the most rewarding so far has been the uh, CWA, New Blood Dagger, long listing. Yes. That's my first book got. And then it was shortlisted for the Times of India Author Awards in India. Yeah. Uh, so that um, gave it some sort. I mean, I was always confident of my work and uh, uh, writing. I mean, you know, you know, you're doing a good job when you've read so much. You know, you've put a, a certain integrity and honesty into your work and you know you've done a decent job. But when you get these sort of external stamps of approval, uh, I they matter. For a writer, this sort of validation uh, matters. Um, so though that's been rewarding to kind of get that uh, stamp of approval so early on in the in my career, which sort of given me a boost of confidence. Fantastic! This has been amazing. So, uh, coming to the end of the conversation, any last words on your book? On the pub, shout out, shout out to the publisher, your editing team, whatever you want to speak in the end. And I'm sure people are already reading the book and more and more readers will join and um, give you comments. So any last words <laughs> on the book, the publishers yes. and everyone? Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm uh, very grateful. My agent, for instance, Kanishka Gupta, who's really helped me get the book uh, published in the UK, US and now in India. My publishers, Joff, Bloomsbury, the editing teams there. So much faith and conviction that they've shown on you, writer. So um unbelievably grateful for them I'm in fact grateful to my family also for putting up with me sometimes because you know there are my mornings I'm very very guarded with my mornings uh, because I'm a morning person and I write well in during early in the morning so they know they can't you know <laughs> come in impinge on that time so they've been patient with me and very often my my daughter will say mama can you come back from Ten Temple Hill and pay attention to what I'm saying because I'll be <laughs> a little spaced out yeah. so but uh, as last words, please pick up the book. It's been written with a lot of love. And uh, I'm very sure that anybody who picks it up, I know they're going to uh, enjoy it. So please pick it up and support writers, read more books. It makes the world a richer place. I'll definitely put the link of the, to the buy the book in the uh, chat below in, uh, in the YouTube that we put in towards the evening today. Such a delightful book, I must say. The plot pacing definitely is very good. It's definitely cozy, definitely comforting. As And as someone said, a gentle mystery with a murderous heart. Thank you so much for being with us today. It Thank means the world to me that you've come back. And it's I'm sure for future books too, we'll be having conversations. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everyone, please do subscribe to the channel so that you can watch such wonderful conversation with such young, yeah, inspiring. You're doing great artists. work, by the way. Yeah, and me. You are doing great work by doing Thank this, Thank uh, you. by having these conversations, and by giving a writers the writers a platform to come and uh, speak on. And uh, you know, unlike a lot of other conversations I have, you actually do take the trouble to read the books. So it's uh, the conversations turn up to be more rewarding. Then, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Meeti. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.